God's grace, his mercy, his peace are yours through our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The word of God we look to comes to us in Micah's prophecy. Just reread a few verses. But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. He will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they will live securely. For then his greatness will reach to the ends of the earth, and he will be their peace. God speaks through his prophet. God is coming. Actually, I would guess that many of you, if you are hosting, know that relatives are coming, right? That's usually what happens at Christmas. You have relatives over. And if they're coming a long distance, that's a great thing. You actually wait. They'll tell you, we're going to try and get there at this time. And you wait for the doorbell to ring. And then there's the, the hugs. And come on in. We have everything ready, waiting for you. And the house is all buzzing with all the faces. Or maybe you're the relatives going to travel. And you'll be greeted at the door with someone excited to see you. Come on in. God is coming. You might actually use that room we call a dining room and have all the seats filled. Usually that's vacant so much, right? And maybe even put an extra leaf in the table and have that extra card table for the kids' table because you've got so many coming and it's the thing you look forward to. You have the, the kitchen is just all the smells of all the food rising up and the house becomes louder and louder as people gather and laugh and it's not annoying when the kids are making noise because it's the grandkids and the cousins are finally getting together. It's awesome when families get together. God is coming. We spend time cleaning houses and getting ready or making food to bring along because we can't wait to get together. Would it be different if you knew that God was coming coming to your house, would you prepare differently? Would you scrub the house down a little bit more? Would you wear a different outfit? Would you have a different attitude? Maybe if God was coming, that, that's a whole different, different thing. Maybe God coming would be more like a, a detective or police officer knocking on your door, a bill collector coming because something is overdue. Maybe you seeing the dog starting to snarl and taking off towards you, you fear a little bit. Or, or the neighbor who knows that it was your lawnmower that threw the rock through his window. God is coming. And this is unfortunately the message that Micah had to deliver to God's people because God wasn't happy. God wasn't happy with his people Israel and Micah had to go and, and preach to these people who had turned subtly away from the Lord and it just over time became worse and worse and he came just very soon after the northern kingdom would be swept away by foreign conquerors about a hundred years after Judah then that you know Judah and Jerusalem in the middle of it would be taken away and so Micah was left to deliver this message and these are the words that are that are written and recorded by God through him hear O peoples all of you listen O earth and all who are in it, that the sovereign Lord may witness against you, the Lord from his holy temple. Look, the Lord is coming from his dwelling place. The mountains melt beneath him and the valleys split apart like wax before the fire, like water rushing down a slope. All this is because of Jake's transgression, because of the sins of the house of Israel. God is coming. And he's going to come like when fire touches wax. If, if you could have seen last night this, this candle after it got a little hot, all of a sudden the wax just spilled down and ran down into the glass around it. Or maybe think of, as he's talking here, of, of this water and mudslide that's coming and coming and in its way it just picks up and sweeps everything away, a mudslide. God is coming and he's coming in judgment. The problem was they in the northern kingdom had appointed their own prophets and these were prophets that just spoke words to itching ears that they wanted to hear right these prophets were saying things like don't prophesy don't prophesy about these things disgrace will not overtake us as Micah was coming and share the truth but God noticed he noticed things that they despised justice that they were plotting as they laid there in their beds at night that they would covet other people's properties and try to find ways to get them that they would actually condone and even um, take part in evil in, instead of good. And this was just becoming the practice of God's people. 
And God actually almost mocks through Micah and tells him, you know the kind of prophet that, that they would like to hear? This is what those prophets. If a liar or deceiver comes and says, I will prophesy for you plenty of wine and beer, he would be just the prophet for this people. Everything is okay, just celebrate and enjoy. That's the kind of prophet they wanted to hear, not like the prophet Micah. Because they started really not to care about their fellow man around them. They cared about themselves. And about themselves, they only cared. Perhaps you and I can sit here 2,700 years later in Lake Mills and say, thank goodness I'm not like those people. Right? We're not exposing our, our weaknesses and open idolatry. We're not, we're not doing the things that they were doing, inviting this kind of judgment from God. God won't come. But there was something else the people were saying, and it, it caused confusion in their own minds thinking this. They said, is not the Lord among us? No disaster will come to us. Isn't the Lord here? We still have his temple and these things. No disaster is going to come our way. It's all okay. And, and maybe they grab this promise from Psalm 91. This is a clear promise of God. It's the one to give us comfort and solace, right? That when God is among us, that he will prevent any disaster coming our way. The same promises that you and I live in. But what had happened is they'd taken this clear promise of God and use it as a hiding place for their sins. Can we do the same? Are we doing the same? These promises of God where we come here and we learn that we are children of our Heavenly Father. A covenant was made in our baptism that God will not break. We, we learn the fact again and again that our sins are forgiven, that God takes them all away. We have nothing to fear. And these promises are true and they protect us from our own conscience, from, from the devil around us, from the world that's courting us in a different direction, from the temptations of the devil. But, but do we use these promises sometimes as a hiding place for our sins? The people in Micah's day thought everything was okay. We give God a little bit of this, but then we do that. And their sins had led them on a path to open idolatry and, and judgment. So do we grow comfortable with our bad habits? Do we act a certain way on, on Sunday or when church people are around, but really the rest of the week or time we just are negative towards everything in life thinking somehow we're victims? Is the recipe that we call life okay to be flavored with just a little bit of anger? Because I had a bad day and it's okay to say that or do that even though it's irrational. Do we use the, the fact that we are Christians and God won't really care if I go and, and find more or I get excited about just going and pursuing that thing that's lustful or, or pursuing that thing that's just pure materialism? Is it okay for us just to have a, a spice of envy and just a dash of, of pride? Is it okay to flavor our lives like that to think, you know what, I'm doing just fine and you can't teach an old dog new tricks. There's no change in me. It's, it's just the way I am. God, I know your expectations are beyond whatever I could achieve, so I'll just give you a little bit of my heart, but the rest of my time and stuff I'll spend on me. Is that the path we're on? Because we see the path that God's people back then were on. And God gave them warning and warning, and they thought, hey, since the Lord is among us, no disaster will come. That crossed their lips. That was a thought in their minds. But what did God say as he saw people that just gave lip service to God but pursued other things? He said, But as for me, I am filled with power, with the Spirit of the Lord, and with justice and might to declare to Jacob his transgression, to Israel his sin. Hear this. And then he says, Jerusalem will become a heap of rubble. And we know from history that it did. That's what happened to God's city where his temple where his dwelling was among his people if that's the path we're on then we're in grave danger too then we need to hear the warning that Micah gave and it was a hard warning to people it, it set them off guard you know what he said he said shave your heads in mourning and finally as they saw all this judgment coming God's people Israel actually vented this they said because we have sinned against the Lord we understand that we'll bear the Lord's wrath like there was no but from that same mouth of Micah who went through in these chapters in this book 
talking about this destruction happening to this city and this is going to happen to this just the way that history would allow it to happen because God's in control. He mentions this one little city, this little burg outside of Jerusalem and he says in this city everything is going to change. And he named it. He called it Bethlehem. And now we see a completely different message from the heart of our God. Today the theme is the love candle is, is lit. This, this message of love and not judgment. We get to see now Micah unravel for us the mystery of God's judgment being taken over by God's love and mercy. And here is what we see as Micah describes his God. Who is a God like you? Who pardons sins and forgives the transgressions of the remnant of his inheritance? You do not stay angry forever, but delight to show mercy. You will again have compassion on us. You will tread our sins underfoot and hurl all our iniquities into the depths of the sea. You will be true to Jacob and show mercy to Abraham as you pledged on oath to our fathers in days long ago. Mike knew full well what God had promised to Moses. And in even the giving of the commandments right after, he said, I am slow to anger and abounding in love. That was his conclusion. Micah knew full well what God had seen in Abraham, the times he'd failed, yet God was consistent in keeping the promise that through your line, the Savior will come and he will bless, be a blessing to all nations. Micah knew that well. He had seen that God had said that as far as the east is from the west, so far will I remove your sins from you. This was all hatched, this hope, by a young virgin in a small little town called Bethlehem. Micah had to look forward to that day, but we get to see how God planned that day and the impact of that day. We hear from Micah's mouth that God would send one who would rule, and his rule would be complete, and he would conquer all those that were held captive by sin. That he would be a, a shepherd king, one who would lead his people to peace and hope. And he wouldn't just be a king that would rule, he would be the good shepherd that would lay his life down for the sheep. That would take away their transgressions so that God would see it no more. That God could connect them to a plan that goes beyond this life to the one he has planned and always planned for all those that follow him. And there they would live and reign with him in peace. This is what Micah got to foretell. This is what we get to see. And this is what Micah said. This is his faith. 700 years before it happened. But as for me, I watch and hope for the Lord. I wait for God, my Savior. My God will hear me. That he could speak and pray to God and know that his prayers would not be ignored and be heard. That God would see the lament of his heart and God would come and bring him peace even though God hadn't fulfilled it yet. Micah knew that God would come. He would have to wait 700 years if he had lived that long to see it. But there's something else that this prophecy that Micah gave did. In the Christmas story, you maybe if you have a nativity scene in your house, you probably have the the guys that have maybe the crowns on, maybe there's three of them, and maybe they came in on camels, or maybe there's an elephant next to them, although we don't know if there was elephants involved, and they come with these boxes with gifts of gold and incense and myrrh, you know what I'm talking about, the wise men. These men of the east that came a long distance being guided by a star, what prophecy did they look to? It was the prophecy of Micah that was given that this is where a king like no other king the king of kings would be born there and he would reign in a different way. His kingdom would be in hearts and he would give relief for people that feared and would give them peace. And this is what stirred Herod to go and do terrible things and trying to destroy this king. He was the one who had sent his wise men to seek from scripture where would this king be born and they found out too it would be in Bethlehem because God said so and God delivered it. That's exactly what God did. And then God sent the one who would change everything to bring peace. Peace to troubled hearts. Peace to people guilt-ridden. Peace in life. 
peace that affects our families and, and what we do, peace that gives us comfort in knowing that God is in control, peace that goes even when we face death itself because we know we have one who has conquered it, peace that knows that our life continues on forever because Jesus had come. To Micah, this was a long time in coming, 700 years, and through Micah, God pointed ahead and said, God is coming. But to you and to me, when we hear these words, and I don't want to give away the thunder of tomorrow and Christmas Day, but listen again, but you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come from me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. We know that story. We know what God has done. We know that God has come.